Now today I wanted to talk about um, that what we saw in Judges 3. I want to encourage you this morning uh, to, to not give up in the fight. You know, there's, uh, we see this cycle of oppression uh, in the Old Testament and I'm hoping that as we look at this, and I've, and I've mentioned this to a lot of people before when I talk about you know, uh, you know, the fight that we're in and, and, and not to give up because we are in the fight of our lives. I mean, it's quite scary what's going on in the government right now. Um, you know, we got, you know, dictator Dan over in Victoria now giving himself emergency powers and, and that actually passing, uh, you know, it looks like it's going to pass. And, you know, just the things that are happening in our country. And, I mean, and, and they're building the quarantine camps now. The quarantine camps are coming, guys. So, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's crazy what's going on. I mean, did you think one day you'd be forced to take a vaccine? You know, that you can't meet for church. Um, you know, you can't, you're illegal to sing to God. You know, and you have your every movement tracked. And you know what? It will get worse if we don't do something about it. Right? It will get worse. Now, is this the end times? You know, I guess the question is, is that time already determined? Or does it depend on how we respond? I'm of the persuasion that it depends on how we respond on when end times will come. And I think it's well within what we do, which might delay it even further. So are you losing hope? Are you wondering, will any resistance we raise make a difference? I mean, even if it was the end, are you just going to lay down and just take it? I mean, it reminds me of the, the movie. I watched the movie The Pianist. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it. It's about the Holocaust as well. And you watch those scenes where literally they're lining up these Jews and just ask them to step out of line and lie on the floor and then a bullet goes through their head. And you think, well, you, may as well, you may as well fight back. I mean, what, are the, what else are you going to do? Right, just take it? So it's a bit like that. I mean, uh, you know, it's like we have Christians these days which would rather be those... Sorry, Jews, that just step out of line, lie on the floor, and take it in the back of the head. You know, I'd rather be those Jews in that movie that were trying to, you know, build up arms spiritually, and they resisted. You know, they lasted like five days, but there was a saying in the movie that said, you know, at least they died with dignity. You know, at least they died. It's, it's like the saying goes, you know, you'd rather die on your feet than live on your knees. And, you know, people especially Christians, you know, they think, oh, the end times, and they give up. They lose, oh, what's, what's the difference? Well, you know, I'd rather go down fighting than not fight at all. But you know what? I think we can make a difference. I don't think end times is just around the corner. You know, it might depend on how we, what we do today. So I want to encourage you this morning that I, I don't think all hope is lost. And I want to show you from Judges 3 uh, this cycle um, that... Oppression comes and oppression can be defeated. And who knows where we are in this cycle? You know, maybe end times is coming closer. Of course, we see the technology, we see the agenda, but, you know, is it 10 years from now? Is it 50 years from now? Is it 100 years from now? Who knows? But perhaps what we do today might be the difference between when it happens 20 years from now or 100 years from now. Right, so let's look into uh, Judges 3 as we talk about uh, this topic. Number one is God proves his people. God proves his people. Judges 3. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So sometimes, you know, this passage, and I preach about this a lot, but, you know, one question that always comes up when people, you know, have objections to Christianity is they say like, well, if, if there's a loving God, you know, why do we go through hard times? Why is there suffering in the world? And here's one of the answers that sometimes God leaves, you know, evil people in the world, worldliness in the world, these things that make it hard for you to prove you, to test you, to see, you know, you know, is it, are you, what, how are you going to respond to what's going on? And ultimately, it's going to improve you as a person. Right? So suffering is not all bad. Good can come through suffering. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. And it's the same with us. We need to go through some suffering in order to better ourselves. 
And that's the positive side of all this COVID crazy stuff that's going on, is that I feel like Christians are waking up. You know, you guys are taking things a little bit more seriously. You guys are appreciating the Word of God a bit more. You guys are appreciating singing to God a bit more. You guys are appreciating gathering with God's people a bit more. So on one side, I'm glad that you're going through some hard times because it was hard enough for me to try to convince you to value these things. But sometimes a little bit of persecution, tribulation, you stop taking it for granted and you say, thank God that we have somewhere to meet and we have somewhere where we can gather, sing praises to God and hear the word of God preached. So God proves us. So your heart is going to be proved during this time. What sort of Christian are you? What's the sort of love you have for God? That's what you've got to be asking yourself at this time. You know, and that's why these times are sometimes good for us to reflect on these things and really think, man, am I living how God wants me to live? Am I using my life effectively? Have I wasted my life so far? You know, am I doing vain things? Verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. You see that, how he left these nations in there because he knew as well, obviously they didn't drive them out, so it was, a, it was a punishment to them too. But also he knew that them being in there would teach the generations that did not see the wars as they went in to teach them how to fight. Right? Because sometimes when things go too well and we're just all prosperous, the fight in us goes. Right? And that's why you're going to see this cycle where the fight comes and then it's prosperity and then people go to ungodliness and then the fight comes back again. To know, to teach them war, at the least such as before, knew nothing thereof. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hemon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. So unfortunately, they did not always pass the test. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Look at Deuteronomy. It says here, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee. So this is not now leaving the nations within the promised land to, to be a thorn in the side of Israel. This is now as he brought them through the wilderness and they went through that hard times in the wilderness 40 years to humble thee, look at this, and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart. Have you ever heard of the analogy of the tea bag in hot water? You know, I, I, I say this a lot, but you put a tea bag in hot water, right? The hot water did not create the flavour of that tea. What did the hot water do? The hot water drew out what was already in the tea bag. And that's this idea here that when you go through a, a little bit of trouble, a little bit of persecution, a little bit of hard times, it reveals to you, like I said, what sort of Christian you are, your level of love for God. And it's not that the hot water created it. The hot water brings out what was already there. Right? So it's revealing to you, it's proving you, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. So, you know, don't let that flavour coming out. You know, maybe if it's a flavour that's not so pleasant to you, don't let that discourage you. Let that make you reflect on that and drive you to go, you know what, I'm going to be different today. I'm going to change. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest, knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, uh, bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So you can see here that God uses the people of the world to prove his own people. So it's going to test, like I said, your love for the Lord. I mean, these things, they're going to teach you what is valuable in this world. I mean, aren't you now, you know, maybe what you valued before 
and the things you took for granted. You don't value those things so much anymore. And now you are starting to value more the things we took for granted. You know, like the freedoms that we used to have in this country. We already talked about, you know, sometimes hard times teach you to fight. You know, so many Christians maybe were ignorant of what was going on, ignorant of the Bible. But now, through these times, it's now teaching you to get into the Word, learn a bit. You know, you had to, you've had to debate people at work or friends and family. It's teaching you some spiritual war, right? It's honing your spiritual sword so that when you go out, you're going to be more effective, you know? That hopefully, uh, you know, like we see the example in Judges 3, that maybe this is not... The, the final battle, that there will be still future times of peace. It's going to teach you to stand up for what is right. You know, we've had it so comfortable. Now some of you are facing losing your jobs and you've had to decide, you know what, am I going to stand for what I believe in? Stand for what's right. You know, now you get an opportunity to do this. You get an opportunity to show some courage. You know, when things are going fine and everything's easy, yeah, it's easy to be bold and brave. It's when things are going against you. That's when it's time to rise up and show some courage. And God is giving us that opportunity to do that. You can't show that courage if there's nothing to be fearful of, right? Hey, maybe it's to teach you more about how government works in this country. You know, I mean, I was starting to look into this stuff even prior to this stuff going on and thinking, you know what, I think Christians and myself included, we're too ignorant on how politics works, how, how government is chosen, our involvement in politics, just all that sort of stuff. And, you know, going through this, now you realise how much government is actually in your life. You know, maybe you're going to take heed to taking part in the process in selecting it, at least, you know. And how many Christians are out, and this is what's one thing that frustrates, frustrates me about, especially the independent fundamental movement, is the, the overarching thought is Christians should not be involved in politics. And it's just a crazy thought. I mean, we are called to be the light and salt in this world. I mean, surely we need to try and have an impact with how the country is run and, and what decisions are made. What else is it going to teach you? It's going to teach you that you can't live like a hermit and have an effective impact. What do I mean by that? You know, now you're at a point in your life where you're thinking, man, I wish I could do something to make a difference. But if all your life, you just, your face is in your phone, you know, you go out and about, you never talk to anyone, you never meet anyone new, you, you know, all you know is like your, your friends on World of Warcraft or whatever, or Fortnite these days, you know, and they're all living in other countries. And you say like, now you're like, I want to make a difference, I want to make a stand. It's like, I don't even know who believes like me. You're on your own. So maybe you should think about, hey, that's why it's important to get to know people. That's why church is important, right? Because church is a network as well. You need to, you know, get out and meet people and connect with like-minded people because in times like this, you need to band together, whether it's at church, whether it's at work, you know, knowing who thinks like you and whether it's in other areas of life as well. So you must learn to work together even with people that you, you know, may disagree with. So you can win some battles. I mean, we see Israel in the Old Testament, sometimes they would partner up you know, with ungodly nations to win a, win a battle. You know? So sometimes that needs to happen. But you know, the world is an influence, but you know, we are largely to blame for the situation we find ourselves in. Why is that? Because it's Christians that know the truth, right? It's Christians that are meant to be the salt and light in the world. Let's see Matthew 5. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. See, we as Christians, we need to stop sitting around thinking somebody else is going to fix the problem. That's what we're here for. That's why God has Christians in the world. We are the light of the world. We want some light in the world. We've got to shine. We can't expect somebody else to fix the problem. And you know what? A lot of the unbelievers out there trying to fix the problem, they're probably just going to bring about the new world order even faster, you know, the way they talk about things. <laughs> we are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. 
A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. You know, I understand that people, some people are more introverted than others. You know, some people are more extroverted than others. But, you know, we've we got to strive as much as possible to, like I said, have an impact on other people. So we need to try as possible to put ourselves out there in uncomfortable situations. Why? Because neither do men light a candle, that's you, and put it under a bushel. You don't hide it, but on a candlestick. You see there that there is a proactive idea there that you are putting yourself out there to be seen. Otherwise, you know, how can you let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven? So we are largely to blame for the situation because either we are hiding that light, but look at what Jesus says here. He says, If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So not only are we damaging it by removing the light from a dark world, but if the light that we're shining is darkness, Jesus says, how great is that darkness? Right? We're making it even darker. So we need to take that on board, that you know, we are largely to blame. Our inactivity, our you know, thorns in our life of the riches of this life and the cares of this life and the pleasures of other things have removed us from fighting for what's important in this world and just being comfortable, right? Let's go into Judges 3 from verse 8. The three Judges. Judges 3 verse 8. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. The children of Israel served Chushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of the Lord cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So you remember Caleb? Caleb was one of the 12 spies. He was with Joshua and he went in and, and he was one of the two spies that you know, were allowed to go into the promised land, him and Joshua, because they were the ones of the 12. Remember 10 said, oh, you know, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And they're too big for us. But they said, no, the Lord's delivered to us. We can go in there. We can, you know, that God has given it to us. But you know, the great thing about Caleb, um, for you, uh, you know, older generation people in the, in the audience here today, Caleb is a great example of somebody who served God not only when he was young, but when he was old as well. Right? Because you remember the story of Caleb. He said, hey, I've still got the strength as I do now, as I did in my youth. And, and he's the man that, we make the song after, you know, I want that mountain. I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eskel grow. I want that mountain. So that is based after Caleb. So Caleb didn't sit back and go, I've done my stint. I'm going to let the young Israelites go into battle and claim the promised land. No, he was right there beside them, being that example, fighting that fight with them. So we need everyone in the battle young old male female you know introverted extroverted everyone needs to be part of the battle to make a difference right and the spirit of the lord came upon him and he judged israel and went out to war and the lord delivered chushan rishathaim king of mesopotamia into his hand and his hand prevailed against chushan rishathaim and the land had rest 40 years and othniel the son of kenaz died and the children of israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So you see, unfortunately, when there isn't strong leadership and examples around, when the cat's away, right, the mice play. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. So this is them now conspiring to, you know, fight back here. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that, you know, we physically fight back. I don't believe that we are called to physically take up arms. 
But I think that there is a spiritual battle at play, right? And a spir what's a spiritual battle? A spiritual battle is a battle of words, right? It's a battle of ideas. You know, I, I, Alex Jones, he coined the phrase, the, the info war. I think that's, a, that's an awesome way to put it, right? That there's an information war going on, and that's the war that we're in. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges. So a two-edged sword, if you think about it, is just like a regular sword, as opposed to like, you know, a knife is only a single edge. So a two-edged sword is on either side. It's not that there's a blade on either side, I don't think. I think it's just a, a little dagger. So he's left-handed, the Bible tells us, and he's got it on his right thigh. So if you can imagine, he's like taking it like this, right, as opposed to trying to take it like that. Um, oh, sorry, this way. Sorry, left-handed. Oh, on his right thigh, that's right, yeah. But he who had made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh, right? And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. <laughs> Are they all the people, the people in power? You know, they get, they get a bit uh, lazy, don't they? Reminds me of the pigs in Animal Farm, you know? Pigs, so the pigs in Animal Farm are like a good, good picture of the, the large politician. Um, and he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. So obviously he's walking into Eglon. There's people helping him carry this present. And he turns them back, and he goes back himself with them, but he kind of sneaks away and comes back. Right? He turned himself again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. So you see how he's left with them, making them think he's left with them. And then he sort of circles back, comes back to see Eglon. He says, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. Who said, so this is now Eglon saying to Ehud, you know, keep silence. So he's saying it's a secret errand. I don't want you to tell me when there's people in my presence. And all that stood by him, Eglon, went out from him. So now it's just Ehud and Eglon. And Ehud came unto him and he was sitting in a summer parlor, right? So there's like this private room that uh, Eglon has for himself. So he asks Ehud he can come in and that's just them. So Ehud goes in and Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Um, it reminds me of that scene. Sorry, I was just, <laughs> just thinking back of these movies I've seen. But it reminds me of that scene of uh, Nathan's going to like this. From Godfather, you know, he just cuts his belly open. It's a bit like that, you know, where he goes in and he's like, and he, and he sticks it into his belly, but I guess he doesn't just like pull it up like in, in the Godfather movie. He thrust it into his belly and the haft also went in. So I'm guessing that that's like the handle of the, of the dagger that he's got. Also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. So it's like Ehud stabbed him and it's like, oh, it's lost for the dagger, it's in there. <laughs> draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. So you can imagine what that is, right? It obviously he's slicing open his intestines, like what is coming out. Then Ehud went forth through the porch. So you see he's gone into this private room and basically he's killed the, the king here that's oppressing them and then he's jumped out the porch, right, rather than going back the other way. Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlour upon him and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlour were locked, they said, surely he covereth his feet in his summer chambers. So what does it mean to cover, his, cover your feet? It's just a euphemism for sleeping. So people thought, uh, you know, the door's locked, Aegon's probably sleeping in there because they don't realise that Ehud has killed him. And they tarried till they were ashamed. So they're like thinking, he's sleeping, sleeping. Well, how's he sleeping for like 24 hours, you know? And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlour. Therefore they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord, so that's Eglon, was fallen down, dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they were tarried, while they were waiting, right? And passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Sarah. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan towards Moab, and suffered not a man to pass over. So you see how like, the act of one person rallied Israel. But he didn't do it on his own, right? He just rallied the people to turn back to God and take action. 
And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor. And there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest fourscore years. And I always find this last verse just funny. <clears throat> uh, in Judges 3, it says, After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad. And he also delivered Israel. So what's an ox goad? So an ox goad is that sharp kind of stick that they would poke um, the cattle with, you know, poke the ox with to get them going. Um, you know, that's why the Bible says that the word of God, the, the words of wise men, is like a, is like a goad, right? Because it kind of prods you in the right direction sometimes. You need a bit of a, a prod to get going. Um, and it's like nails, so it sort of fastens things down and also gets people moving. It says here of Shamgar Ranath, which slew the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat. And he also delivered Israel. Now, some things I want you to think about here is we see here the story of Othniel, right? Ehud and Shamgar. And we see like these individuals that God uses to raise up his people and to resist, right? And to fight back. And this is how God operates. God raises up people. And you can see like it only requires one person to raise up and look at the difference that they can make. See, God can use you this way as well. You know, it reminds me of the story of Gideon. This is a couple of chapters later. Gideon is in the book of Judges as well. And look what it says here. Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. So you see how Gideon is complaining about the current situation, thinking, What is God doing about it? And look at how God responds. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou, that's singular, right? Thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? Have not I sent thee? Now why is that important? Because too many Christians sit around complaining about how things are. Oh, I can't believe they're doing this. I can't believe God is allowing this, you know. Oh, it's because it's end times and there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> Have not I sent thee? Maybe that's why you exist in the world. You're seeing the problems that exist in this world. Maybe that's why you're here, to make the difference. Have not I sent thee? But you know, if we just are like Gideon, hiding, threshing the waking, making sure that we're just taken care of and not putting ourselves out there on that candlestick, you know, Maybe the person who's there to make a difference won't be there, right? What's another thing I want you to think about here and what gives me hope? Look at this. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Chushan Rishathaim eight years. See, we read over these times, but eight years. Now how long have we been under COVID? It's COVID authority, authoritarian two years and we're like ah oh, it's end times it's god there's no hope at all you know it's like forever <laughs> it's eight years it's four times what we've gone through but look somebody was raised up six we still got six years maybe and then somebody's going to raise up all right and look at how much how many years they had rest the land had rest 40 years 40 years after eight years of oppression but they rose up and this is the pattern that you see it's like you see this pattern that's what i'm talking about the cycle of oppression that you see these short periods of oppression or short you know in terms of years compared to the length that you know that the fight was worth it because it it, it gave them so many more years of peace look so the children of israel served eglon the king of Moab. 18 years. Remember the first scenario? It was, what was it? Eight years and then 40 years of peace. Look at this one. 18 years of oppression. You know how many years of peace after this one? Look at this. And the land had rest 
four score years. You're like, Victor, I have no idea what four score means. A score is 20 years. So that's 80 years of rest there. I mean, most of us have not even lived 80 years. You know, we, we, we were like living at the end of this 80 years and now we're going back into the two years, you know, of, of oppression. And it goes on. Look at it here in Judges 5. The, uh, Judges 4. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So this is um, later on. This is uh, Jabin of Canaan, right? The story of Sisera, you remember? The, the guy that died in the tent from jail. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Can you believe that? Being oppressed for 20 years? I mean, the, the sort of despair you'd be in, you'd think like, I mean, if you grew up in that oppression, you'd think like, nothing's going to change. This is how it was since I was born. But then 20 years later, we see here that jail killed the guy in the tent and all that happened. That was the bar Barak and, and, and uh, Deborah, if you remember the story. And the land had rest 40 years. And even, you know, we talked about Gideon, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. But we read at the end of Judges 8, thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. So there seems to be a pattern where there are years of oppression, but they seem to be always shorter. So that's why I'm asking you here today, I mean, is it, are we really in that situation yet? Should we really give up hope? Should we really think, oh, it's not worth fighting when it's two years of oppression? And we're not fighting under blood. Like We're going to look at this passage later in Hebrews. But two years, hey, we still got maybe a few years and you know, maybe there will be a revolution. And, you know, maybe, I'm not saying that end times is not going to come one day. But how many of these cycles are we away? One, two, three, you know, maybe in a couple of years' time, ten years' time. I'm hoping that we'll see a few decades of peace, like we see in the Bible. And maybe in another generation, it'll, it'll fall and go into the end times. But, you know, at least I can say, you know, I, I fought... I stood, I made my voice known. Don't you want to be able to look your children in the eye and say, I fought back. I didn't just roll over and let this happen. That's what I want to be able to say. And hopefully, we can make a difference. So number three, it's my final point. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If these times we're going through have, have, have reminded you of anything, it's that we have too many vain things in our lives. And it's taking away our attention, it's taking away our time, and you know what, if, if a lot of that time that we spent into these vain things in our lives, the thorns in our life, the riches, the pleasures and the cares of this life, we actually fought doing something that mattered for eternity, I think we'd live in a completely different Australia. <laughs> At least a completely different New South Wales. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This is why we're able to keep going and not give up, because we know who's gone before us who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. That means think about what Jesus went through, and that will make you think that, you know, what you're going through is really not that bad. And honestly, you know, if I was to be honest, I mean, obviously people are losing their jobs and things like that, but let's be honest with ourselves, guys. It's, it's not as bad as it could be. Right? I mean, it could be a lot worse. So don't let it get to that point before you decide to go, you know what, I better do something. You know, when you're sitting behind in a jail cell in a, in a, in a, in a quarantine camp somewhere, you know, oh, man, I better do something. Get out of this quarantine camp. <laughs> we better do something now. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You see how you quit, because you quit here first before you quit the actions. Ye have not resisted, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. All right, so we are, 
Uh, it's, not, it's not as bad as it could be. But we got to run, right? So consider this, right? It talks about this race that is set before us. Don't quit. I think there is still hope for us to at least have maybe a few more decades of peace. But I think it depends on what Christians do today uh, will make a difference. So 1 Corinthians 9, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So what is he saying here? He's saying if there's a race, they're all running, but there's only one winner. Now this is the part I want you to focus on here. So run that ye may obtain. So run that ye may obtain. What does that mean? That says run this race like you want to win it. You know, too many Christians are just happy to just, I'm in the race and get their participation sticker that everyone gets now. I ran, I ran in a race. You know, I'm sure, I think they used, they used to give that out when I was in primary school. You know, you get the sticker for the participation sticker. The Bible's saying you ought not be content with just getting the participation sticker. Right? The Bible's telling us, hey, so run that you may obtain. That's how we're meant to be running this race. That's how we're meant to be fighting. That's how we're meant to be living as a Christian. Living like we want to win it. Are we going to win it? Who knows? But live like you want to win it. Live and fight till the end. Right? And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Temperate. What does that mean? Disciplined. So this goes back to the vain things in your life. Disciplined. Right? Not wasting your time all the time and consistently investing time doing things that matter. So they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. Isn't that the sad thing? That the people in this world will strive blood, sweat, and tears, and yet the things that they achieve, the Bible calls, it's a corruptible crown. Why? Because one day it's not even going to matter. But we an incorruptible. So we are striving for a prize that is more valuable, that is eternal, and yet we run and are happy with just a participation sticker. <laughs> I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So, in conclusion, you know, no one but God knows the future. So, what will this country look like five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now? I mean, we don't know. I mean, we've gone through two years so far, but we see in the Bible, I mean, you know, that, that may be a very small portion of the oppression that is coming here. But I don't want to be here 10 years from now regretting what we could have done about it today. Right? Because no one regrets giving it a go and failing. But you know, I'm sure a lot of us here 20, 30 years from now will look back and maybe regret, man, I should have done something back then. Right? So let's not let that be us. And I hope that as we see these cycles of oppression in the Old Testament, that gives us encouragement not to quit and to keep up the fight. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. And thank you that uh, you give us hope from your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, that that encourages us not to faint in our minds. Help us to stand up for what is right. Help us to preach the gospel. Help us to be a light and salt in this world. Uh, we ask you to help us, Lord. Give us the grace to do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.